we're super excited for everyone who's joining us right now. Uh, again, for those of you who don't know me, I am Lily Jagzinski. I'm with Moves United, and we appreciate you joining us for the Adaptive Snowboarding 101 class today. I am super excited to have Reggie Showers and Kep Kepi on here as well. Uh, feel free to tune your view to speaker view or gallery view up at the top right. If you are joining us, we are going to ask everyone to just mute themselves to minimize distractions. And you can use the chat function at any point in time throughout this webinar. Um, we are going to do a live Q&A towards the end of this session. And so if you have questions throughout this webinar, feel free to send them in the chat box, either privately or publicly, and we'll try and get those to the end. Uh, and with that said, if you want to turn on your video so we can see your faces, awesome. If not, feel free to just hang out here. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Reggie and Kep to take us away. Hey, everybody. Hey, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what's up, Kep? Reggie, great to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you, too. Uh, my name is Reggie Showers. I am one of the uh, adaptive snowboarding coaches with Move United Sport. Uh, I work closely with uh, Kep Kepi at a, a number of different events all throughout the, uh, the snowboarding season. Uh, a little teeny background uh, on myself. I am a, uh, an amputee. I'm a bilateral below knee amputee. I have been for over 40 years as a result of an electrical accident that I suffered when I was a kid. And, um, and this was back in 1978. <clears throat> so snowboarding wasn't even a thing uh, for me. I was just really looking forward to getting back on my bicycle. Um, but uh, never let the amputation stop me. I always had uh, lofty goals. Um, the prosthetic equipment back in those days was very archaic compared to what it is today. Um, so I struggled with uh, trying to accomplish a lot of my sporting goals, and I got into motorcycle racing, believe it or not. And ended up winning some world championships in drag racing and as an amputee, set a bunch of uh, uh, world records for elapsed time and miles per hour as an amputee. And then I got uh, introduced into snow, snowboarding by a friend of mine. And uh, I thought it was hella challenging. I, I knew it was going to be super hard. And I, I totally loved it. Once I, I, uh, I got into it, and I crashed a bunch of times. My legs fell off. People freaked out when they saw my prosthetic legs, uh, thinking that I had severed, um, had a, a total disconnection with, um, with a leg or something. They didn't know I was an amputee. But uh, I really started to branch out and go to different mountains and meet lots of cool people like Kep and other adaptive athletes and the community really started to grow. And one of the most important things that we did was we started to share information, share uh, resources. And each adaptive athlete is a resource within themselves for the rest of the community because not all of us know everything. We, our situations are all different and, uh, and we pull from each other to help the, the community as a whole to enjoy this awesome lifestyle. And that's what it is. It's a lifestyle of snowboarding. So that's a little bit on me and I kept, maybe you can uh, talk about yourself a little bit and how you got into snowboarding and, and, uh, and adaptive coaching. Yeah, thanks Reg. Uh, uh, like Reggie said, we've worked together quite a bit, uh, worked for Move United for several years now um, and known each other for, for quite a long time now. Um, I got involved with snowboarding. Uh, I was a avid um, snowboarder from moving out here to Colorado uh, 20 plus years ago. Um, I ended up having an injury, shattered my femur. Um, at that same time, I met Amy Purdy and a, a couple other adaptive athletes that were up here um, where I live in Crested Butte for a snowboarding, snowboarding group. And um, just got to see some other people that were doing some really cool things. And that kind of helped me bounce back from a big injury. Um, and I ended up working for uh, Amy Purdy's organization, um, Adaptive Action Sports, uh, with her and her husband, Daniel Gale. Um, helped those guys run some of our adaptive national events uh, for quite a few years. That's where I met Reggie. And um, yeah, I've been, been a snowboarder uh, since since 1999, uh, kind of the same way Reggie, uh, just learned on my own, beat myself up quite a bit. Um, and then over the years, I've been able to kind of hone the craft and uh, become an instructor and a coach. Uh, currently a uh, coach with, with um, Team USA, with the U.S. Paris snowboarding team um, as a development coach. 
I work as an instructor for the Adaptive Sports Center here where I live in Crested Butte, Colorado. Work with uh, Team Simplify, and then uh, also uh, love love working with uh, Move United. Usually, we're at Ski Spec, and um, and then another uh, race camp that we do in uh, Stowe, Vermont. Um, and this year, everything's changed a little bit, but uh, excited to be able to share all this information with everybody that's out there, and hopefully get people out on the snow, um, learn a little bit more um, on the internet, and then uh, be able to take some of these. Uh, skills and knowledge and try to try to get out on the snow and get moving with it so uh yeah thanks again reg um and lily and everybody at move united thanks again to everybody for joining in today should be uh an awesome 45 minutes or so of uh intro about snowboarding and everything else and um if you guys have questions we'll be able to answer all this at the end so thanks guys yep so how about we jump into adaptive snowboarding 101 and talk about what is snowboarding. Um, you know, if you look up the, the definition of snowboarding, you know, most dictionaries will tell you it's just being able to strap a board, a snowboard to your feet um, and slide down a snow covered hill. And a lot of people would say that it's a sport or a pastime. And a lot of us who got into snowboarding and, and have, uh, have loved it have really come to realize that snowboarding is more than a pastime or a sport. It's actually a lifestyle. You know, it's a culture, if you will. Um, there's so many things that I've adapted into my life as a result of my time on the hill and, and off the hill. Um, some of the relationships, the friendships that I've made um, through snowboarding have lasted, you know, for years and have had a, a really great therapeutic impact in the quality of my everyday life, even when I'm not on hill. So, I mean, the gear, you know, the music, um, the, the vibe, you know, when you're on the hill, just being able to slide down a snow covered hill and have total control <laughs> to an extent, because there's times when we're, we've all been a little bit out of control when we, when we push the edge, uh, but have control of that snowboard while you're sliding down this, this mountain. I mean, it, it's, it's, Kep, I mean, you can expand. I, it's sometimes I'm at a loss for words when I try to tell people how beautiful and therapeutic and, and, and magic and spiritual riding a snowboard is. Right. Well, Reggie and I met um, at USASA Snowboard Nationals um, at our Adaptive Nationals quite a few years ago. And um, for, that, for that year when we were all together, um, we rented this huge house. We had 25 people that were staying in this house. 2008 in Frisco. Yeah, 2008. Yep. It was, it was huge house that had uh, plenty of space. Um, but yeah, there were, there was, we had uh, athletes from six different countries that were represented there. Um, athletes of all different abilities, disabilities that were there. Um, like I said, that's when Reggie and I met and that's kind of like that, the family aspect and culture and a community aspect of it. It was, that was really incredible back then, which helped all of us kind of lead this into um, the Paralympic movement. Um, so, you know, like Reggie was saying, something that's uh, just sliding down the hill is actually um, got so many other levels to it. Um, and that, that's the one thing that we want to share with everybody else. Yes, it's an individual sport um, or it's an individual activity. But really, if you're out, if you're able to go out, um, if you have a guide or an instructor or some friends that you can go out with, um, it's one of the best sports, therapeutic sports that's out there. And um, that is one thing that we definitely want to echo is the fact that, um, you know, when you're dialed in on the snow, the rest of the world goes away. Um, that's right. You, your mental focus, your your physical energy that that's tapped into snowboarding is something that uh, you just you can't replace it. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of these Zoom uh, webinars and, and trying to share this information with the, uh, the hopes and, and goals that, that everybody can take this information and then get out on snow and really put it to use. Because um, that's, that's really what we're trying to achieve here is, is trying to get, get folks out on the snow. So, uh, yeah, snowboarding is, uh, it's the cure uh, for, <laughs> for sure. sure. So, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the ultimate goals uh, for a lot of snowboarders, as you can see on the screen, if you, if you are uh, watching the screen, um, is to make the Olympics or the Paralympics and compete 
and represent their country against some of the, the greatest snowboarding athletes um, in, in the world. But that's not the ultimate goal for every snowboarder. You know, a lot of people just want to be able to go out and enjoy the, um, the, the hill. And, um, and that's, that should be, I'm sorry about the phone <laughs> ringing, but it's the reality of, of life nowadays. Um, that's just the, the, the ultimate goal for a lot of people, just to be able to be safe and, and control their snowboard um, down the hill amongst uh, all the other people that are out there enjoying uh, uh, skis and snowboards as well. So maybe we can move. Right, and that, yeah, that, is the, uh, that is the next level is, uh, is having a love and a passion for snowboarding. Um, if, if you're really excited about it and there's some opportunities you can continue to go on, um, making it to the Paralympic team um, is an incredible experience, but that's not the end all be all. Um, that's right. We've got, we've got a ton of athletes that have made it to that level um, that now just want to share that with their own kids that they're raising and sharing it with, with friends and family and, and just getting out and riding for fun, because that's, that's a true love and passion that hopefully you develop for snowboarding. I know that's why Reggie and I have shared this incredible friendship and, and been on an incredible journey is just because of that that true love um, for just getting out and, and being free. Um, and that's, that's one of the other things I wanted to highlight is, um, um, you know, some people might be labored and walking 10 feet. Um, and if you strap a snowboard on your feet, you can glide for 10 feet and be effortless um, once you learn some of these skills. So it's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely one of those things that if you have a, a chairlift takes you to the top of the mountain, um, that becomes your mountain, you know, you, uh, you get a chance to uh, express yourself however you want coming down the mountain, um, whether you're riding forwards, uh, which is, you know, regular or uh, goofy, which is um, with your right foot forward um, or, or doing tricks or whatever it is, jumping off of stuff. Uh, if you just want to get a speed fix and you can go as fast as you want or slow as you want, it's, um, it's, it's an incredible dance down the mountain. And that's something that it's not the, the true definition of it, but it definitely is um, uh, a dance down the mountain. Uh, so yeah, well, cool. Um, that's the quick intro for us. Uh, just talking a little bit about what snowboarding is. Hopefully um, you all have that knowledge of snowboarding. Um, some of the next things that we'll, we'll uh, highlight here or uh, are the uh, equipment. Um, so that's one of the things that we'll, we'll touch base on here next. Um, Reggie, you want to start out with some boards there? So obviously, you know, what you're going to need is a snowboard. Uh, that's why, why we're there. We're there, the snowboard, and you'll need a board to ride on. And um, snowboards come in a variety of sizes, uh, different widths and lengths. Um, that is uh, dependent upon your what, what type of riding style that you expect to, to have on the hill, um, your weight, your, your height, all that uh, plays into uh, what type of board that you will be able to select and purchase. Um, and a board professional or you know, some of the board shops can help you make that determination. Um, there's lots of resources on the internet that you can read up on um, before you purchase your first board if you wanna go that route. Uh, I took a deep breath and I purchased all my, my equipment because I, I just had a feeling that I was going to like um, uh, snowboarding so much. Um, so yeah, the, the board is very, very, it's a, an important part of your success uh, riding down a snow, riding down a hill on a snowboard. And there's different types. Uh, Kev, you want to talk about the camber or rocker boards, um, off camber. Um. So there's a, uh... Lily's got that listed there for board technology. There's a couple different things. Um, I try to use this as the simplest form. There's a smiley face and a frowny face. Um, the, uh, the frown face is the one that typically we use more for uh, border cross racing um, because that frown face, when you, get your, when you get your feet onto that board, it actually compresses and you get a better edge control um, just for faster carving and just faster riding all together. Um, the other one, so that's called, a, it's called cambered um, board when it, when it has a frown. Um, 
like the, the board on the bottom of the uh, the list there. Right. So the rocker board is more like a smiley face um, or reverse camber is something that's really good for when you're in powder um, because it, it's kind of like the bottom of a boat. It just, it naturally wants to kind of push your, uh, the nose up out of the snow and it makes it a little bit surfier and um, floatier, I guess, um, for lack of better words there. Um, yeah, they, all the board technology is just, um, when, when you're starting, when you're learning, um, a lot of the boards that they have, Burton has this LTR, Learn to Ride series, and the boards are pretty flat. They're neither um, reverse cambered or cambered. They're pretty much just flat, and they, they actually kind of grind, grind the edges off of them a little bit. So it just makes it a, um, a better learning platform. Um, but yeah, like Reggie was saying, um, you can purchase your own equipment. That's one of the best ways of ensuring that um, – that you have consistency. Um, but when you're starting out, some of your equipment, some of your boards, um, you might be going through an, a program that has boards set up for you, or you're taking a lesson and um, they've got boards that are set up for you. So you're renting that gear. Um, and that's a great way to start. Uh, it's a great way of trying out some different equipment um, and see what works best for you. Um, like I said, most of our um, race athletes I've got a couple boards. I've got three boards behind me here. Um, two of them are set as uh, kind of race boards, and one of them is got the uh, is more of a powder board. Um, it's all different tools for the trade. Um, you know, like for any other job, you've got a couple different tools that you use. Um, you start to figure those things out. Which one you like best? Um, there's different levels of stiffness. Uh, flexibility, everything. So it's uh, when, when you're starting out, it's just figuring out what works best for you, learning some of these skills. As you build the skills, then you're going to have more um, of an understanding and knowledge of what maybe you want to go to next. You can feel those differences in the boards. Um, so yeah, I know, I know Reggie's um, had quite a few boards over the years, and he, he typically tries staying with um, a custom or a custom X, which is a little bit stiffer board. It's a faster board just the way that it's built and um that's his style you know um and that's kind of snowboarding is about your own style it's figuring out yep. what works that's best right. for you. if we can uh, go back to that slot there you go with general equipment uh, and one thing i wanted to, to touch base on that, that uh we we're talking about um all this information may seem overwhelming at first but believe me we, we talked about this in the pre-race in the pre uh uh the pre-presentation meeting, um, every pro was once a rookie. Every professional in any sport or any racing capacity or anything in life that's, that is professionally done, they were once a rookie. Always remember that. So all this stuff comes at you and as you get into it and sample it and experience it at your own pace and your own level, you will become accustomed to uh, everything that's involved with, uh, with snowboarding uh, and, and anything else that you uh, apply yourself to. So with snowboarding, you know, we went over to snowboard, you're going to need a helmet, a really good helmet that fits you properly because um, you want to protect your noggin. And I'm going to be one of the first to tell you that, uh, are you going to fall? Yes, you're going to fall. And one of the first things that I teach um, my students is the proper way to fall because you're on snow you're you're yeah, snow is slippery you know ice is slippery and you're on a board that has wax on the bottom of it the bottom of it which allows you to slide down the hill um so yeah it's going to be a little bit foreign at first until you learn the parameters until you develop muscle memory to learn how to control the board so are you going to fall yes you're going to fall but how you fall is key. And it's one of the things we teach um, is to fall properly to where you will not get hurt. Uh, and we do start off slow. Um, so yeah, you're gonna need a helmet, which is really, really important. Some goggles uh, to protect your eyes. Uh, believe it or not, even on, um, on uh, cloudy days, uh, the sun can pierce through the clouds and be very bright or you, you'll have days that are uh, low light visibility, you need goggles with different lenses um, that will enhance the quality of your vision. 
Um, also, you know, blocking out any uh, adverse weather conditions, any snow, any sleet, all that kind of stuff. You're going to need snowboard boots, boots that fit your feet or your prosthetic feet uh, properly. And those boots will then go into a set of bindings, which the bindings screw to the snowboard. And then the boots strap to the bindings. And that's how you connect to your snowboard. Um, those bindings have a, a different array of uh, adjustments. There's a high back that uh, offers a different level of leverage when you're trying to um, put pressure on either your, your, your toe edge or your heel edge. Um, the bindings can be moved forward and backwards. Um, you can adjust your stance uh, you make your stance a little bit wider on the board or a little bit narrower. Those of you who can see the, uh, the diagram here on the screen, you'll see there's a bunch of holes in the snowboard. Uh, those holes are mounting points for your bindings. So there is no one size fits all with, when it comes to snowboarding. Kep, like Kep mentioned earlier about uh, goofy and regular. You know, if you take a lesson and your, your instructor is, is goofy, which means right foot forward, um, you know, you, and you don't feel cof comfortable, you know, you may want to go left foot forward and ride regular. Uh, it's all about personal preference and what makes you feel comfortable riding the snowboard um, and, and stances and, and toe in and toe out. And there's just, just a ton of different uh, adjustments. No one adjustment is the perfect adjustment for everybody. It's all about personal preference. So, um, yeah, that, that's one of the unique parts about snowboarding is that your setup is individual for you. You're going to yep. have a different size, um, foot than somebody else or a different boot um so you might set up your straps in a different manner everything most of the straps are all similar they have a ratchet system um and, and you really want to get your your equipment set before you go out on snow um, a lot of times when reggie and i are doing clinics or uh, working with with athletes um one of the first things we do is we take a look at the board and make sure that the bindings are on correctly make sure that they're not that nothing really looks too goofy or out of the normal. Um, Cause a lot of times we have athletes that are flying in, they might be racing to put their, put their gear on their boards. And even some of our top athletes will, uh, you look down and they've put the bindings backwards. You know, they've mounted the board backwards or whatever it is. And it's, it's things that happen. Um, but those little attentions to detail are um, what you want to go through. Just like uh, if you're operating a car or anything else, you want to kind of right. go through, check the nuts and bolts, uh, check everything, make sure everything is set up as best for you as possible. And then um, like Reggie was saying that there's an infinite amount of adjustments you can do with high backs um, and with your bindings, as far as um, directions here, they're usually in three degree increments and those little adjustments can actually make your riding so much better. Um, those are the things that you want to, um, once you get a little more proficient is you want to try to play around with those because anybody can learn, uh, like on a rental setup or whatever it is, um, they can learn on the board that they're learning on, but then once you get that foundation, you want to be able to kind of make those minuscule adjustments to and be progress. the best rider possible and progress. That's right. And progress. And that's it. Yeah. And that's kind of that you know, learn the foundations, learn the basics, and then build from there. And that's, um, you know, that's one of the things like Reggie said, there's a, there's a lot of adjustments. He, he didn't even factor in the fact that he's got a two prosthesis that he can make <laughs> an infinite amount of adjustments yeah, to as yeah. well. So that's, um, you know, that's one of the things we'll highlight here a little bit later. Um, but as far as the general um, snowboarding list, uh, the gloves are amazing. Um, you know, you might want to look into uh, wrist guards as well, um, especially when you're learning. Um, so making sure you have gloves and uh, wrist guards that maybe fit under or over. Um, and then just your, your personal equipment that you have, um, having a good snow jacket. If, it's, uh, if you're on the East Coast and it's, and it's kind of wet, uh, making sure you have something that's uh, waterproof or water resistant so you're not out there just freezing in the uh, that drizzle or kind of that, that weird un, un snow un rain drizzle and uh, sleet and kind of stuff that happens sometimes. Um, also with having snow pants, snow pants, keeping you dry. Um, that's one of the things that's going to be 
your first line of defense. If you've got some pretty good equipment on, that'll keep you, um, that'll keep you out there longer. Um, if you get cold and you have to go in, that means that's less time worst. on the snow. That's right. That's um, the worst. It, you know, we were talking about this earlier of layering. So you have, um, you have like a base layer that's on and then maybe a fleece um, or a puffy jacket or something. And then a layer over that that's waterproof and wind resistant. And then if you start getting hot, a lot of them have pit zips that you can open or you open your, your you know, open your zip on the front or whatever it is um, to regulate your temperature. Mm -hmm. If you're cold, it's really tough to get warm. Um, if you're warm, you can always take a layer off. So that's kind of, we always layer while we're doing these things, uh, doing these big events. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a couple other things in, adding in uh, maybe some uh, hand and feet warmers. Those are a couple dollar investment that you can always throw in your pockets. And if you need them, they're there. Um, it's just, it's a lot easier to, uh, to take uh, those hand warmers and shake them up and put them in your hands if you're cold oh, to man, maybe stay best. out for another couple of runs and have a, <laughs> they a, are the a best. better experience. They are. Yeah. They truly are. Yeah. They've, they've um, come in handy on many occasions. Um, and I, and I, I carry a lot of them in my, my backpack to give out to different um, students or athletes um, that are cold. Um, and with technology, if I can add this cap, with technology being uh, the way it is now, um, there's lots of uh, uh, jackets and vests, uh, top layers and, and bottom layers that uh, have uh, electric heaters in them that you can connect to a, a lithium battery, which will keep your core uh, warm. Uh, like Kep said, you know, once you get cold, it's hard to, to get warm when you're out on a hill and it's going to ruin your experience and your learning, your capacity for learning when you're out there, when you're cold and miserable. So you really want to pre-plan, uh, check out the weather before you go out, uh, make sure you have the proper layers. And, you know, if it's an option for you to get a, a heated vest or, or a top or, or bottom layer. Yeah. And, you, you know, if you think about it, um, uh, if, if you're in the adaptive community, um, you might have um, limb loss or limb indifference. Um, these are things that are, um, that are going to change the way that your system uh, operates on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. Um, so you might have some days where you're just extra cold um, starting out today and then being out on the hill all day is going to be something where you really want that that extra bit of warmth or whatever it is to, to maybe stay out there and have a better experience. Um, and, you know, it's uh, it definitely is an energy suck just being out in the cold. So anything you can do to uh, kind of stay ahead of that will be something that'll hopefully get you a better, better experience while you're out there um, and keep you out on the hill longer. Um, safety is the number one thing when you go out on the snow and just trying to, trying to stay ahead of it. Um, the must haves are a helmet. Um, I mean, that, that is just to go back. Um, with Move United, you always have to wear a helmet. Any Absolutely. of the programming that we do, um, and I believe that's a blanket, um, policy that goes across to all the move united programs now is uh helmets are mandatory so um you know those are a couple of things that you definitely want to invest in um having some of your own gear having your own helmet that fits um you know that it's uh that it fits you correctly and you know that it's yours it's your space it's your comfortable uh environment that you create so goggles um helmets some of those things gloves you definitely want to get those um borrowing a snow jacket or snow pants is something that's totally reasonable to get started borrowing snowboard uh, uh gear snowboards and, and bindings and boots and some of those things are are a great way of starting but um just kind of investing that little bit in yourself is where you'll see that return on investment because you you start to get comfortable with that it's uh, consistent and those are the things that you really want to um you really want to look into um first uh yeah and then um at the top of the list there is a, a lift ticket um if you do go to a resort uh lift tickets are mandatory um there's a whole list on the back a fine print of um all the stuff that they they kind of uh warn you about um snowboarding is a dangerous dangerous uh activity i guess uh it can be awesome. It can be uh, freeing. It can be one of the coolest things you ever do. But there are 
still some chances you catch an edge and you thump thump the snow pretty hard or whatever heading down the hill and we've all been there yeah exactly and it's uh those are some of the inherent dangers of anything you go out on snow you can slip and fall uh you know walking across the street in the snowy conditions um so hopefully you guys can all um get out and have a positive experience with snowboarding and learn in the best way man in the best manner um work with some people that like like reggie said will teach you how to fall how to pull all of your uh extremities into your body to protect them and um and, and how to or how to put them out in a proper way to protect yourself um if I can you know, interject from, real quick, uh, Kep, about lift tickets. Um, yeah. Lift tickets are going to be one of the single most uh, uh, expensive investments on a regular, on a recurring basis that you're you're going to you're going to make um, going snowboarding. Uh, lift tickets can be hella expensive, especially if you go to some of the bigger resorts, the bigger mountains, Vail. Um, you know, like one hundred and seventy, two hundred dollars a day. I think Vail is $175 a day or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. It's pretty expensive. Um, a lot of uh, your, your mountains are $125, $150. Some of your smaller mountains of you know, $60, $75 $75 for a lift ticket. You might want to invest or take the time to do some research and look to see if the mountain has adaptive programming. If they have adaptive discounts for, uh, for people who do want to ride a snowboard um, who are you know disabled um, there are some really good discounts available for us the disabled community when it comes to lift tickets and even uh, better discounts if you want to invest in a season pass if you know that you're going to be going to the mountain on a recurring basis you this is something that you want to learn to do it's something that you want to pursue throughout the season you might want to just go ahead if you have the funds to go ahead and invest in a season pass which I know some adaptive season passes are only like $450. So you're looking at, you know, unlimited riding throughout the whole season for $450 when one lift ticket can be $175. So definitely do your research. For me personally, if a mountain does not have an adaptive program or an adaptive discount for, uh, for riders when it comes to lift tickets, I, I don't support them. I'll go somewhere that does uh, support the adaptive community. So it's something you want to look into. Yeah, I know, uh, I know there's a lot of programs that are out there that can help direct you towards uh, getting, getting a season pass. Um, there's some programs that are out there, uh, grants and programs that are out there that will actually- Grants as well, yep. Get you a pass uh, yep. for the season and help you get some equipment. Um, yep. You know, right now we're just trying to, we're just trying to, see if everybody can uh, get excited about snowboarding, get out there and um, learn some of these basics. Um, that investment is worth it for sure. Um, you know, these, these are a couple of the things that really, really help, um, help continue to have that, uh, that lifelong journey with snowboarding. So yeah, thanks yep. Reggie. Yep. yep. Um, we'll move on to this next one here. Um, adaptive equipment. There's a lot of adaptive equipment that's out there. Um, you know, uh, traditionally for snowboarding uh, in the adaptive world, you're still going to be uh, riding in an upright position. Um, that means you've got the ability, the strength, the ability, um, the balance and everything to, to ride in a traditional snowboarding stance, which would be standing up. Um, you might need some help with that. Um, the beginning, you might uh, need some outriggers, and outrigger is uh, is basically an uh, uh, extended ski pole with a ski uh, with a small ski on the bottom of it that's there for support. It has um, it has a cuff, just kind of like um, like crutches. Uh, crutches, right? So it's it's essentially a crutch, um, an arm crutch with a uh, with a small ski on it. You can kind of put out um, for a little. A little more balance, a little more support. Um, so there's some things that are that are set like that that'll help you uh, stay in an upright position. Um, also, um, like if you if you go through a program and you're trying to uh, work with an instructor, they might put you on tethers, and tethers um, uh, are uh, basically a rope system. Um, it's webbing 
that can be tied around um, your your ankle. Um, it can be tied to the front of your board. And what you're doing with tethers is um, you're able to control that a little bit um, as an instructor or guide to, to help initiate some turns for people. It's also a way of um, this kind of control and help control speed for somebody. Um, so there's some stuff like that that's out there as far as equipment that's, um, that's kind of set for um, just being better tools to help um, individuals with their, with their adaptive snowboarding. Um, there's also something, uh, Bobby Palm, who is, uh, Reggie, Reggie, my Bobby instructor, uh, yep. our adaptive instructor that gave us our level one back Signed in the us day. Off. Yep. Yeah, he did. Uh, he, him and a couple other guys created this thing called the rider bar. And if you, if you can see that top photo there, um, the rider bar is actually a snowboard. It has a big, um, upside down U shape that's connected to it and it's connected to the bindings. And so the instructor can actually uh, hold on to that on one side, the student can hold on to it for support on the other side. And the instructor can, can uh, help get some leverage there with uh, a heel edge and toe edge and um, try to get, try to get things set, um, you know, for, uh, for helping out as best as it can. Um, anyway, um, we're, uh, we're going to buzz through a couple more things here. Um, Reg, if you want to talk a little bit about prosthesis. Yeah, um, real quick, I'll, I'll talk about a prosthesis. Being an, I'm an amputee. Um, I can tell you from experience, the, the better that your prosthesis fits, if you are an amputee, the better that it fits when you're walking, the better experience you're going to have on the hill when you're snowboarding. It's one of the worst things in the world is to come to the hill and you have a sloppy fit or an ill-fitting prosthesis and then you strap into a snowboard and you're going to start putting pressures and leverage on your, your residual limb that you're not used to having you know, while you're walking because you're not walking, you're on a snowboard. So definitely, definitely want to uh, make sure that your prosthesis fits, that you, all your bolts and uh, your screws and nuts and your leg are, are tight. Um, uh, your suspension system, suspension meaning how your prosthesis connects to your leg. There's different types of suspension systems for us amputees. There's, there's suction, um, there's elevated vacuum, there's a pin lock system, there's people who use a sleeve. Uh, I personally prefer the pin lock system. It seems to be the most secure way of securing the prosthesis uh, to my leg. And then this is through years of trial and error with other different types of suspension systems, um, that pin lock offers me the greatest sense of connection and, um, and confidence that my leg is not going to come off when I'm snowboarding. So you definitely want to uh, do some research, talk to your prosthetist, you know, about some of your goals. Hey, I want to go snowboarding. What's the best way of keeping my leg attached to my body when I'm on this snowboard and make sure it fits uh, properly. So. Yeah, these are all great ways of um, uh, just getting into the sport, figuring those things out, what works best for you. Um, there's a lot of resources. Reggie and I spoke, spoke to this earlier. Um, there weren't, 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of resources out there. Um, you didn't have YouTube channels to help get you involved in, in tutorials and things like that. So there's a lot of resources that are out there um, within the adaptive community already. And that's we're trying to highlight some of this and, and, and create a better system. So you always just kind of check in and, and um, find out uh, some of the tricks and uh, the trade and stuff like that to yep. get moving. Yep. Um, yeah, there's quite a few adaptive tools. A ski pal is another one that's, that um, we use for helping keep people upright. It's essentially a hula hoop that's there for support. Um, and then there's other braces or um, equipment that you might find that, that's beneficial for you. So it's a, you know, it's, snowboarding is your own experience. Hopefully you'll, you'll figure out a few things that work best for you. Um, and, and there's definitely a bigger community base now of um, athletes that you can reach out to that can help share their experiences. Um, everybody's a little bit different, but um, hopefully we can, we can highlight a couple more things to keep you guys uh, moving and get you out on the snow. Um, so what's the next step? The next step is trying to contact um, a Move United organization and, and see if you can get a lesson um, or go ride with a program. Um, wherever you live, there's gotta be um, 
for the most part, there's got to be a, a program that's within a few hours drive of you. And um, hopefully it's a, a program that you like. Um, you can get involved with some people there um, and that you can make those relationships and friendships with some people to get out on snow. Um, I know Reggie, uh, Reggie's worked with quite a few smaller programs over the years on the East Coast. And there's a lot of, a lot of places that you can get out to, um, like I said, within a few hours drive. Um, I live in Colorado, um, within three or four hour drive here, there's probably five or six pro programs. Um, so you, you do want to try to, um, build your experience off of wherever you are and then, um, and hopefully they have good snow for the season. That's the, uh, and some good weather. That's the next thing. Mm -hmm. And you can contact uh, move United by going to their website, move United sport.org move United sport.org. And there's tons of uh, valuable resources there on their website. You can always uh, look at their contact list and call them. They will pick up the phone and uh, give you all the answers that you need to help you uh, accomplish your, your goals, whether it be on snow or uh, whatever other sport, you know, a summer sport, spring sport uh, that you want to uh, be a part of. And uh, yeah, and schedule a lesson. Schedule a lesson at some of these, uh, these organizations and these programs, these mountains that are out there. Um, the more that we're out there on snow, the more that people, the general public sees the adaptive community out there snowboarding and skiing, the more uh, the word is going to be spread, the more awareness that we present to the general public, the more programs that are going to be available to us at the smaller uh, mountains and, and just all mountains in general. Um, so yeah, that's, this, is, this is our goal is to have total inclusivity, you know, all across the world really to allow uh, people who do live with a disability to be able to do the things that they love and to pursue the goals that they uh, want to pursue. And, and we're no different than everybody else. You know, we just do things a little bit differently uh, when it comes to it. So um, yeah, what to expect. Um, tell them what they should need, you know, kept about sunscreen and, and proper hydration and all that kind of stuff. Are you there, Kat? Well, maybe he's not. So what to expect, uh, a lesson versus a free ride. The first thing that you're gonna do uh, when you go to the hill is, you know, you're gonna schedule a lesson with, a, uh, with, a, with an instructor. Uh, that instructor will be uh, certified to um, teach you and your adaptive uh, needs. Um, so and that's what, what we specialize in is adaptive snowboarding. Uh, we've been through the training, so you'll, you'll be with somebody who has the proper qualifications to, to handle your situation and to safely get you down the hill. Now, you don't want to come down, you know, a black diamond on your first day on the hill. You'll definitely start off on a bunny slope. And depending on your progression throughout the day and your skill set um, and, and um, you know, if, if, you, if you're tired, you know, if you're at altitude, you may want to take some breaks and all that kind of stuff, you know, you'll probably stay on the bunny slope for the better part of the day. But there are people that have moved up to some green, some nice, smooth green slopes to practice some of the fundamentals that they learn in the bunny slopes. So uh, the chairlift, the chairlift is one of the most challenging um, aspects of snowboarding, you know, getting on the chairlift and getting on off the chairlift. But you can always, always, always ask the lifties, we call them lifties, the people who run the chairlifts, we can always ask them for a slowdown. They can slow the chair as you get on and they can slow the chair as you get off uh, the lift. So that's, there's, it reduces the uh, chance of uh, your falling. It reduces your anxiety. You can always tell them to slow it down or you can tell them to stop it. Um, and we wanna always take note of the weather conditions so we can properly prepare for the weather that's gonna be out there hydrate, 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 especially when you're at altitude. When you're at higher altitude mountains, you definitely want to hydrate and bring some, uh, some type of a, a granola bar or um, you know, some munchies to keep you fueled. So you'll have the energy, you'll have the focus to really um, have a successful lesson when you're on the mountain. Right. Uh, like, like Reggie said, ideally, you're going to be out there for the better part of the day. Um, to learn. Um, a lot of people can pick up snowboarding within a few days. Um, if you take a lesson, uh, hopefully the instructors are going to get you 
up on a board, get you used to having that that board strapped to your feet and doing some of the, the never ever progressions to get you moving um, in a safe manner and try to keep you upright. Um, those progressions that you learn um, are going to get you to that green run, hopefully within mm -hmm. a few days, um, you know, and, and you're going to get moving. Um, you get moving pretty quick on a snowboard. Um, the one of the things to remember is uh, like we said, working with your instructor or taking that lesson um, through an organization with Move United, you've got professionals and volunteers that have been doing this for a long time that can help you. Um, we wanna try to ensure that you have a safe, the safest uh, learning experience possible and um, that you can come back to snowboarding. Um, there's definitely a lot, of, uh, a lot of people that are out there that have knowledge, um, getting the right equipment set, getting, um, getting that uh, partnership that you're developing with, uh, with some programs, adaptive programs out there, something that can, that can continue, um, continue your success for snowboarding. Um, that's the family, that's the culture, that's what um, Move United is about, that's what the organization is about for, um, for really bringing all these programs together and bringing adaptive athletes together. So um, yeah. Thanks again, guys, uh, for joining in. I think we're going to take a couple questions now. Um, the... Yep, Kev, you're just on mute again. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, but I, you you teed me up correctly for the key. I'm, I'm on an iPhone 5 here. I've got uh, the higher end of technology available. So, sorry. <laughs> no, doing great. All right, so we, we do have some great questions. And Reggie and Kev, thanks for taking through taking us through all the basics. Uh, I am new to snow sports as well. And I love just learning what do I need to do if I've never been on a mountain before. So great overview so far. Um, some quick questions in regard to costs, please. And it can be general numbers. We know it's going to vary from place to place. But what would the rental equipment look like? What would a lesson look like? How much would an estimate be? What's the length of a lesson? Any of those details and estimated numbers would be great, please. Um, I can start with just some some um, estimates for the program where I'm at here, the Adaptive Sports Center. Um, our our day rate is two hundred dollars. Um, that does include a lift ticket. Um, it does include all your rentals, from helmet to everything, head to toe. You're covered. That's for actually all a good deal. Year. That's a great deal. Um, yeah. We also have some military um, grants that are available, which that same, that same package is worth, uh, is, is $35. So we have um, um, some military grants, which cover uh, to get uh, injured men and service women back on the snow with their families and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of programs that are out there that, um, especially right now, um, that might have some extra deals that are going on and be able to get you an incredible rate. Um, that same, that same um, package to go through the mountain, to have an individual instructor is gonna cost you six or $700. Plus you're gonna to have to buy your lift ticket um, on top of that. And, um, and you're gonna to have to do a gear rental. So you're looking at like maybe a thousand dollars for just going through like a normal ski school and renting all this equipment and getting past it. So really reach out to your organizations that are closest to you they usually have equipment um, and some discounted rates and some incredible instructors uh, and volunteers that can help get you get you moving on a snowboard. Um, yeah, it can be a bit pricier. Um, one of the things I was going to mention um, was look at Craigslist kind of once you get going. Um, there's some uh, some good deals on Craigslist for some used equipment. Like once Facebook you kind of get set. Marketplace, eBay, yeah. Facebook Marketplace. Yeah. I mean, there's great equipment that people – you know, like us, like Kep and my, myself, you know, we, we get one board and then we get another board. And then next thing you know, we've got five boards and all these bindings and all these boots. And he's like, you know what, let me just sell this and sell that at, at, a, at a really good price and hook somebody else up to get them yeah. involved with snow sports or snowboarding. And you can find some really good deals if you do your work, do your homework uh, on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, eBay, um, and, and even some of the snow shops. Some of the, the shops out there will have consignment items or even really drastic discounts on some of last year's items that are brand new. 
you know, they're right. just last year's items. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, great question. And for lessons, um, what does that typically look like? How long do they run for? So you can, um, you can sign up a lot of programs. You do a half day lesson, you do a full day lesson, um, typically a half day lesson. Uh, you'd be going into a programming office. Um, they get you set up with all your gear that you need, um, your lift tickets, all that stuff. And then um, be on snow for maybe two to three hours. Um, and so you'd be done by lunchtime. So, you know, you'd be looking at like a nine o'clock start time, nine, nine thirty start time and done by noon. Um, you know, an afternoon session would be starting at 1230 or one and then maybe going to 330 or four for that half day. Um, some programs will will offer you a half day and then let you just go out on the hill to figure some things out by yourself if you want. Um, with the equipment. So there's, um, there's a lot of uh, cool opportunities. Um, you know, typically if, if you're learning a couple of hours is going to be a lot of work, uh, initially, you know, initially. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and being at altitude, it's going to be a lot of work and yeah. you're going to be welcoming that break, <laughs> you know, right. to get off and digest uh, everything that I just learned and come back tomorrow and do it again. Awesome. Yeah. Another great question there. Um, uh, yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things, um, just like anything else, um, if you're really pushing yourself uh, and you're feeling pretty good, it's OK to call it for the day um, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, if you just do a morning session and um, you feel like you've learned a bunch and you want to save some energy for the next day. That's perfect. Um, a lot of times when you really push things, maybe like, oh, I'll, I'll do this second session, you push a little bit harder. That's when you can run into fatigue and some of those issues that, uh, that may or may not have the best learning experience for you. So it's always good. Learn a little bit. Um, sometimes too, when you, um, when you get off the snow for a minute, you come back to it the next day, it's like a, a restart. Um, it's a refresher. So it's, uh, sometimes that's a better learning model is to do a half day, come back the next day, um, kind of, kind of shut your brain off, let your body recover and, um, just, be well rested for it. So um, it's all personal, personal preference. Um, typically when you start, this can be a two, three, four day process to really kind of get your edges and start making some turns. Thank you. Uh, this is another question, but it's a little bit higher than just a beginner. You had talked about wax on the snowboards. Um, if I was a beginner athlete, am I doing that? Is the, the lesson or the instructor doing it? And if I am by myself, how can I tell how much wax I should and not put on? Any details? I can tell you from my own personal experience. Um, uh, the, the first season that I rode my snowboard, I really didn't know anything about maintenance other than keeping the screws tight. I didn't know anything about uh, wax performance, dynamics, uh, the different types of waxes that are, were out there that you want to apply to get the optimum performance on your snowboard, depending on the conditions that you're riding in, you know, the temperature conditions, there's different waxes for different temperatures. Um, I didn't know anything about that. And I can tell you uh, that I have some friends that have been riding for, uh, for years that know nothing about wax technology either. They don't know any, they don't know how to wax a board. They don't know how to, you know, maintain. Um, there's a service, you can take your board to a board shop and have them wax it for you. And that's a, a great option for you if you don't wanna invest in the time or the energy into learning how to wax your own board. So uh, they'll charge like, what is it 10, $15 cap or 20 bucks, depending on the tune up. Uh, they may sharpen yeah. your edges, um, lots of wax. Um, me personally, after I got into snowboarding, I started looking at videos on YouTube on how to wax your board, how to maintain your board. There's a lot of great resources on YouTube. Um, and I started to purchase equipment you know, off of eBay, um, different waxes, a waxing iron, um, as scrapers. Uh, there's tons of instructional videos that'll show you how to do that yourself. It's not that hard uh, once you do it. And or one of the, the best things you can do is get with a person like myself or Kep that can walk you through the process while we're at the mountain. You know, once you show, once you see how to do it a couple of times, um, then you can go off and do it on your own and start maintaining your board properly. So, Kep, you might want to add something in there. 
Yeah, just the initial stages. Uh, if you're if you're going to a program, um, usually their rental gear is in pretty good shape. Uh, mm -hmm. They they keep wax on it um, just so it's operating um, proficiently. And then um, if you do buy equipment, um, maybe maybe have um, if it's from a third party, maybe take it to a shop and have them do the edges and, and put some wax yep. on it, tune it up just to make yep. sure that it's like that it's set for going out. Uh, but when you're first beginning, um, you could end up riding on a coffee table and you don't really know the difference, I suppose. <laughs> well, you let know. me tell you a quick story about the, uh, my, my, my experience with wax and going out west. I, and it's really quick. I, I'm on the East Coast and we ride on ice. So everything is very slippery. Everything is very fast. So when I went to Colorado to Copper Mountain the very first time, I didn't know anything about waxing my board. And, you know, I had ridden the board on the East Coast for so long. But when I strapped my board in in the lift line uh, to skate over to the chair, um, once I tried to skate, it was like glue. <laughs> my board wouldn't move. And I was like, oh, man, because the snow was powdery. It was a different quality snow. It wasn't ice that I was accustomed to riding on in the East Coast. It was powder. So I had to take the board off, unstrap, go into a, a board shop and get a quick wax put on that would allow me to slide down a hill. Um, so it's really important to stay up on your, your wax um, uh, and your tune up on your snowboard. And that's something that, you know, as a snowboarder, you will become accustomed to maintaining your equipment, um, tightening the screws and all, as well as staying up on your wax jobs. Thank you. All right, so we're running um, about two minutes until we finish up. So I'm gonna say a few more closing remarks. Um, but before I do that, Reggie and Kev, do you have anything further that you want to add for this beginning session, knowing that we're gonna be able to meet again for the future? I just hope that everybody uh, got a lot out of some of the information that, that we shared. Um, it's really, really rewarding to be together. Um, this is what we miss with our snowboarding family. Um, and this is what we have now due to the pandemic. So hopefully you guys will come back for uh, the continuing series, the webinar series. And I always want to thank Move United for putting this all together. And um, Kep? Yeah, thanks for everybody who tuned in today. Um, really looking forward to the next couple uh, webinars um, to go further into snowboarding, um, answer some more of those detailed questions and, and share some more of our knowledge and experience with adaptive snowboarding. Um, I mean, Reggie's lived this for, uh, for 40 plus years. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge for, for a ton of uh, prosthesis um, and, and adaptive snowboarding. Um, I've been in adaptive snowboarding for about 15 years now. And um, yeah, we've, we, we just wanna share as much as we can with everybody that's out there and, and um, hopefully get some more people out on the snow. You guys so. are our tribe. We're all one tribe. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, for those who are interested in joining us next week, it's going to be the same time, same place. It'll be Wednesday, February 3rd from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to focus a little bit more on snowboard cultures and norms. So some of the questions that you may have, you'll, you might get them answered next week. Uh, we are going to dive further into more about the competitions and races to Paralympics and what that pipeline looks like. So definitely stay tuned. This session was recorded and we're gonna put it up on our Move United YouTube page as well. And so if you miss something and you wanna go back, please feel free to check it out on our YouTube page. We'll probably get it uploaded within the next like 48 hours. So be patient with us. Um, additionally, if you haven't already registered for the next session, we've changed our registration system just a little bit where you don't have to answer every single question every single time. So we're trying to make your life easier, which is great. I know some people, saying yes, thank you. Um, so you'll use the same link that you received an email on. Um, it says that see that me link. And if you are here, that means you've already registered and all you have to do is log in with your email address and confirmation number, which you've received in multiple emails. Um, but if you need help, feel free to reach out to us and you just have to add in that session to your registration. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We've also put the link in for Move United member organizations themselves too. So you can go online, check out where you are um, state by state. We list out all of our organizations and you can see if that uh, organization offers skiing and snowboarding and seeing if you can get involved. 
So thank you so much, Kef and Reggie, you guys are a wealth of knowledge. I look forward to learning more from you. We're gonna stay on a little bit longer just in case people need the links in there, but feel free to hit the bottom on the right-hand side that says leave meeting. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you everyone and have a great day.